We have an awesome week that's coming up this week. It's going to be a glorious week for us, but it's not going to be a wonderful week for turkeys, for they're all going to die. And we are going to have a great time. This Wednesday, we do not have a service because of Thanksgiving and also because, as you have heard already, we have an awesome weekend coming up on Saturday at 7 o'clock. We have a special service with um, one man named C.S. Up the Groove. Now, most of you probably have not heard of him. Um, some of you have heard of A.A. A. Allen. A.A. A. Allen is a man that God used in extraordinary ways, in just supernatural ways in the United States a few generations ago. And C.S. Up the Groove was right, right around him and actually pastored his church in Miracle Valley. And he's already an older gentleman as he's going to be here on Saturday night and Sunday morning. And so I would just really encourage you not to miss it. There's going to be a lot of people, literally people are flying from all around the United States to be here. And on, also on Sunday after the ministry of CS Up the Groove, once a month, we pray for the sick and people who are oppressed by the devil. Some of you remember last prayer line where we had a girl who was, a, uh, who was dedicated to demons at the age of five through cutting of her finger because her parents are Satanists. And there was a crazy battle of uh, six men who couldn't hold her down. And she was only 17 or 19 years of age and, um, and she, when she was delivered here in a spot. And so we're going to believe for crazy deliverances, mighty miracles, and the glory of God to be released this coming Sunday. Amen. So Wednesday, no service. Friday night, we meet for night prayer. Last Friday night prayer was off the hook. It was amazing. The presence of God was powerful. And then Saturday we have a service and Sunday. So it's going to be a three-day combo. Amen. It's going to be a wonderful, wonderful time. Last time there was a lady that came on a wheelchair here. She's from Portland area. And she's, if I'm not mistaken, if my memory is not betraying me, 67? 67 years of age. She did not walk for two years already. Not that she had difficulty in walking like some, but she couldn't walk at all. She was just on the wheelchair. They rolled her in here. We prayed for her for those cases. We usually don't pray in a prayer line. We give them specific moments. And we took her to the room and we, we prayed for her. Um, nothing happened on the spot. And she went home. We encouraged her to continue to walk by faith. She goes back home and she, uh, after I guess in the evening of that Sunday, she got up from her wheelchair and she started to walk. And so uh, on Wednesday, the family that knows her, you know, came on Wednesday and literally ran. And Joy says, you have no idea what happened. She says, she is walking. She still goes back to the wheelchair because she, she's really old now. And she has diabetes and a few other things and stuff. And so, but as before, she couldn't even stand on both of her feet. And so we just give God the glory. We're never moved by what we see happen here. We are moved by what God says that's supposed to happen in people's lives. Can somebody say amen? And so we're just going to believe for mighty things to happen this coming weekend. I just really encourage you, do not miss church next Sunday. Because our pastor is going to be back. I'm not the pastor. Um, I am just uh, the person who, uh, well, anyway. But uh, our pastor is going to be back this weekend. And so we are really, really excited. And so if today's service you were saying, eh, come next weekend. The real deal is going to be here, okay? And God is going to do wonderful, glorious things. And, uh, but today we're going to still be in the presence of God. God is going to speak to us and we're going to have a wonderful time. Amen? Amen. God is good. And all the time. Amen. Amen. You all look so wonderful. Amen. This church is such a wonderful place to be in where we are a family composed of different cultures, uh, different backgrounds, different uh, ethnic upbringings. But we still have one blood. The blood of Jesus Christ that makes us one. Amen. And so, and the word of God and each one of you today. And so we, we love you, uh, all of you who are here, those of you who are visiting us and those of you who have made this church your family. Uh, we thank you that you do your best uh, to a lot of people that come and visit. And usually that's what they leave with. You know, they say they feel the energy. And uh, see, many people don't know the word for the Holy Spirit. And so, uh, well, energy will fly. And, uh, and they feel like a family. And that's what we want it to be like. Amen. I am going to share uh, with you a message about the tale of two souls. But before the message, um, there, was, there was a story of um, one boy sitting with a dog by the, country, by the country club. And a gentleman comes to the boy and says that, does your dog bite? And the boy replied back, he says, my dog does not bite. 
So the gentleman, the older gentleman decides to pet the dog. And as he tries to pet the dog, the dog bit off his hand. So the gentleman looked at the boy and says, why didn't you tell me that your dog bites? He says, I never told you this was my dog. Some of you will get it tomorrow and you will laugh. And you're going to tell your friend that they will laugh and it's going to be good. Amen. How many of you have a dog at home? Okay. Make sure you do not use that on somebody. Okay. <laughs> that story is very dear to me because I got bitten by a dog when I was about, I think, 11. Uh, there's a teacher that was helping me with math and she had a dog and, well, I don't know what happened to the dog. And he ran off and bit me right here, bit a piece of meat. So they had to go and they had to stitch it up and stuff. And I still have a mark. I won't show it to you. I believe you trust me and stuff. So, but I got bitten by a dog. So anything with the dog or uh, cats are fine, but, but dogs, they're just, just vicious, vicious. I think it's somewhere in the Bible that says that people who are not serving like Jesus would be like dogs or something. Uh, don't, don't remember that. Stefan will, will let you know that. If you have your Bible, uh, I want to go to uh, a scripture in 1 Samuel chapter 19. I have three scriptures and I'm going to give you two, but just read one. 1 Samuel chapter 19 verse 23. King Saul went there to Naoth in Ramah when the Spirit of God was upon him also. And he went on and prophesied until he came to Naoth in Ramah. And he also stripped off his clothes and prophesied before Samuel in like manner. And lay down naked all, day de all that day and all that night. And therefore they say, is Saul also among the prophets? The other verse that I'm not going to read for the, for the sake of time that you can write down in Acts chapter 9 verse 9. We saw a little video about Paul who became Paul. He was Paul but he was Saul the Pharisee and he um, persecuting the church and how he met God in Acts chapter 9 it describes and then one more verse is two verses in Matthew chapter 7 verse 22 and verse 23 and it's when Jesus says that many will come to me that day and say that I prophesied in your name I healed in your name I raised the dead in your name I cast out demons I did all of these things and Jesus will say I don't know who you are depart from me you are workers of iniquity let's just open up in prayer say Lord Jesus open my heart to your word Lord Jesus open my heart to your spirit Lord Jesus open my heart to your faith amen amen before we talk in a moment about King Saul King Saul spent a big portion of his life chasing a little boy named David and most of us know David from the stories in Sunday school and our precious kids are learning those kind of stories right now where David killed a Goliath and when he faced a Goliath he ran at Goliath. He wasn't running from him. He wasn't afraid of him. He ran at him and it was a big sign of courage. But then David spent half of his life, well not a lot less than half of his life, but he spent quite a few years running from Saul. And I remember reading it this week and I'm like, wow, what a paradox. David is a young man who's not afraid of Goliath and he runs at him. And then he spends a large portion of his life running from a madman named Saul. David could have easily threw a spear at Saul and nailed him with one shot. He could have, he could have thrown a stone at Saul and killed him. But David was a man after God's heart. When David ran at Goliath, it was courage. But when David ran from Saul, it was integrity. And we need both to have lasting success. Each one of us will be challenged to run at our problem instead of running from our problem. Each one of us will be challenged to fly and to run away from challenges, to run away from difficulties. Many men and young women run away from responsibilities. Many people will quit their marriages because they run from problems. Some will run from their home because they run from problems. Some people will quit school because they run from problems of doing homework and exams and showing up on time. And we must learn like David not to run from our Goliath but to run at our Goliath trusting God will give us victory. But at the same time 
there are things you and I must run from. Real, real lasting success is not only when you challenge and overcome your problems. Real lasting success is when you also have the feet of the deer to run from sin and temptation like David ran from Saul. And many people that's where we fail. We have the tenacious and we have the just the victorious powerful spirit to conquer anything that comes our way we develop a survival instinct inside of us to just go through hell and high water and still to maintain our faith but then there comes the part where we have to run from things we feel like it's being a victim to run from things we just run at them and that's where lack of integrity grows and that jeopardizes our success it jeopardizes our spiritual growth we must understand to run at Goliath requires faith to run from Saul requires fear of God and we need both every one of us here we need to be people of courage and we need to be people of integrity people of integrity run from the smell of sin people of integrity are like Joseph they run from Potiphar's wife people of integrity when they see a temptation and for different people that temptation might be in different forms and shapes but you run from it remember when you're running from sin you are truly running after God and you are running into your destiny can somebody say amen and that's what we learned from David King Saul was possessed by evil spirits King Saul was tormented by evil spirits and therefore he wanted to kill his son-in-law David King Saul held a spear beside him all the time because he was possessed by an unclean spirit. When King Saul was rejected by God and when he rejected God, he opened himself up for the influence of evil spirits. Demons are real. They don't exist only on the screens in movie theaters on Friday night. They don't exist in the imagination of writers who write the script for the blockbuster movies that many people in our generation go and see. Demons are real entities that live on the earth. Demons can torment and afflict Christians. Because a Christian is not somebody who carries a label. A Christian is somebody who is such in the heart. King Saul was an Israelite tormented and possessed by evil spirit. King Saul still did all the religious rituals and on the outside he looked everything was fine on the inside he was tormented by the devils why anytime we reject God we attract demonic now I know a lot of people when it comes to anything with demonic or anytime Christian can be attacked by demonic or influenced by demonic they immediately have a lot of interesting ideas and I want to just want to shatter those ideas in your mind up front. Alex, can you stand by the, by the light switch? When you reject God, you immediately attract demonic. Turn off the lights. Turn off the lights, all of them here. These ones too. Okay. What happened is in this room, we turned off the light. We did not invite the darkness. None of us called for darkness. I did not ask to turn on darkness. Nobody turned on darkness. The only thing we did in this room is we turned off the light. What happened? Where was darkness? It was always in this room. The only thing that caused this darkness not to be seen is the fact the light was here. When we reject the light, something happens. Darkness immediately comes in. You don't have to invite in it, it. You don't have to believe in it. You don't have to call it. You don't even have to go to witchcraft to find it. It comes in. Demonic, we attract the power of the enemy into our life when we reject the power of Jesus in our life. Can somebody say amen? Let's turn on the lights again. Prophet T.B. Joshua says, to that degree we reject the light will be the degree we will be filled with the horrifying darkness. You don't have to practice witchcraft to be under influence of demonic. What you have to do is turn off the light. Reject God's word. Reject God's presence and you will be tormented. The doctor will give you prescriptions for your torment. The religion will give you an explanation for your problem with your psychic. 
and people will give you things and the bars will give you liquid and all kinds of drinks to do to deal with your problem but in reality in King Saul's case the moment he rejected the word of God he opened himself up for demonic influence and people many people live today under demonic influence my friends there is no three options when light is off darkness is here there is no option three People will say, well, I don't like Jesus and I don't like demons. Can you imagine what would happen in this room when we say, I don't like the light and I don't like the darkness. Foolish and stupid. Can somebody say amen? And as Christians, our goal is not to just fight the darkness. Our goal is to stay in the light of God. He is the light and for us to walk in the light. And that's exactly how the darkness will not live in us. Not just by saying, I hate darkness. No, we shouldn't be cursing the light. We should turn on the light. We should not be cursing the darkness. We should turn on the light. King Saul proves a very vital theory. A very powerful truth is when we reject the light, we will be filled with the horrifying darkness. And in order to live and have the light of God in your life, you have to welcome it and accept it for the glory of God. Can somebody say amen? King Saul, he is under influence of the enemy. And we know that he, he lives a life full of jealousy, full of envy. He's provoked by the smallest things. I mean, lyrics of the songs. And he goes ballistic trying to kill David. Things are really, really difficult and challenging in his life. And then the scripture says one day David runs away from him already twice. He tried to kill him once and he tried to kill him twice and nothing works out and then David runs for his life. His wife helped him to get away from the house knowing that the threat is imminent and he runs and he goes to Samuel the prophet who anointed him to be a king in the first place in this city named Ramah. He goes there and he spends their time with Samuel and Saul finds out that David hangs out with Samuel. So he sends a little guard with some weapons to bring David back or to kill him. They go in there and it's almost similar as the story of prophet Elijah when they, they sent to kill and to take prophet Elijah and the fire came and killed them. But in this case uh, Samuel uh, doesn't kill them. The Holy Spirit arrests him. So they come to arrest David and they end up being arrested by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit makes him prophesy. So I mean imagine they come to kill David and they end up all prophesying. So King Saul sees that they're not bringing David back. He, dis he, he dispatches another you know set of people says go find them and David. Have you ever had to do that? Send somebody to do something then you had to send somebody else to get them and do that? That's exactly what happened in this story. He sends them and the Bible says they same thing happened. Holy Spirit arrests them and they start to prophesy. So Saul gets really irritated. He says the third group, he says, hey guys, give me those two other guys, two other groups and bring me David. Well, the Holy Spirit falls upon them and they begin to prophesy too. So Saul decides to go himself and bring David and bring all of his army back. And the Bible says the moment he gets close to the city, the Spirit of God comes upon him. And comes upon him so heavily that King Saul that he doesn't just speak in tongues he doesn't just you know lift his hands and has you know butterfly feelings in his stomach he doesn't just have you know like this amazing experience the Bible says he starts to prophesy he's laying on the floor naked and stuff some translations and some historians say that it wasn't physically naked that it was just he removed his kingly garments and for a king to be without kingly garments is almost to be like naked because that's his garments are like his identity and so but no matter what he was like literally undignified prophesying day prophesying night and then that grace that grace lifted King Saul goes back home and it seems like everything is fine for a little bit. He no longer chases David but then he starts the same thing again. Pause that for a moment. Let's go to the New Testament book of Acts chapter 9. There was another Saul. He's a Pharisee. He devoted to the law and his mission in life is to kill Christians. This Saul, his mission in life is to kill David this Saul is his mission in life is to kill Christians and he is not going to see this Saul is going to Rama to kill David this Saul is going to Damascus to kill Christians he has letters he's going to go and kill them because he already has been doing that and the Bible says that on the way to Damascus 
I'm not sure whether Christians already knew his coming and they started to pray. We're not sure whether, you know, it was him seeing how Stephen was being stoned and how he prayed to God and his face was like the face of an angel and just the presence of God was on him that made an impact. We're not sure whether it was Christians who were fasting and praying that God is going to change his heart. We don't know the background but we know one thing is he is walking toward Damascus riding his beast. An angel of God, the presence of God, the light of God comes against him. He falls off and he encounters God. Now this Saul goes prophesying and this Saul goes blind. Three days blind. He doesn't eat anything. He goes to Damascus and he has an experience with God. The only difference is that when this Saul woke up from his experience with God, he went back killing David. And when this Saul woke up from his experience with God, he went back saving people. This Saul went into the history as the first and really, really bad king of Israel. This Saul went into history as one of the greatest apostles who ever lived on the planet, whose writings we still read today. Both had an experience. One became an apostate. Another one became an apostle. What happened? Why did one, why can one have an experience with God and last for a moment and the other one can have an experience with God and his life can change so much that he can change the lives of other people? We have to ask that question today. I want everyone to pay attention. People who get saved, people who experience deliverance or people who experience prophecy, people who experience the presence of the Holy Spirit in their life. It may not be an extraordinary way like King Saul did where you are on the floor all day and all night prophesying. But we've seen even cases like these. When the Holy Spirit comes upon the person and they, they speak in tongues for a whole night, unstop. They can't. The presence of God is so overwhelming. You're looking at them and you're looking at the person who is drunk in the street and there's so many similarities. They're, you're literally, they're full of new wine. They're full, full of the presence of God. That their life is so amazing and it seems like everything is going to change from that. You're, you're looking at them, you're like, this is going to be the next Billy Graham. This is going to be the next general of God. And you see two, three, four months later, they're like Saul. They go back to the same thing that they had. And then you see other people who have a genuine experience with God. I remember even when Bryson, when the first time Bryson came to our encounter, when he just got saved and Holy Spirit, and he was still a young kid, really just a young kid and during the first session on Friday night at Lyle Washington Holy Spirit came upon him I mean he fell on the floor and started speaking in tongues and you look at Bryson's life today you know 19 years of age now and he's different today than he was before and what's going to happen still in future God is going to even show and have greater glory than what he had in his past I want to make a few simple observations between those these two stories and they're so important because we don't just want an experience we also want to have a fruit from that experience Jesus shared in Matthew chapter 7 the scripture that I've told you Matthew chapter 7 verse 22 and 23 Jesus says many will come to me in the last day and they will say Lord we prophesied in your name Lord we did this in your name and Jesus will say that I do not know you it's interesting that everybody takes that scripture and labels that upon anybody who prophesies, heals the, sick, heals the sick, or casts out demons. The moment you mention to a religious person that we see people healed, they say, oh, Jesus said, in my name people will heal the sick. And Jesus will say, I don't know them. The moment you say, oh, we go to this church and there's this man, prophet T.B. Joshua, he prophesies. Oh, we know. Jesus said, they will prophesy in my name. You say, oh, you know, last month we had this amazing deliverance. This person was delivered who was dedicated to witchcraft. It was so amazing. And they say, oh, Jesus said, they will cast out demons in my name. So anybody who casts out demons, heals the sick, or prophesies, the moment that scripture, Matthew 7, is labeled unto them. But what the scripture really means 
it's kind of what happened in the story of Saul he prophesied but for a moment he prophesied but after that prophecy Jesus says I never knew you you practice lawlessness King Saul goes and has an experience where he prophesies for a moment not for a life but for a moment and after that when the experience wears out when the feelings wear out he goes back to the same way that he lived before that prophecy and ends up consulting a witch and committing suicide that is what Jesus is talking about you cannot take the scripture on Matthew chapter 7 and label upon every healing, every deliverance or every prophecy. That scripture does not belong there. Amen. Because Jesus says those who believe in me will lay hands upon the sick. They will cast out evil spirits and if they drink anything deadly they will not get hurt by it and they will preach the gospel. That is for us but we as Christians today we remind ourselves that it's possible to hit a moment of experience with God not necessarily prophesying casting out demons and healing the sick but a moment when you come to the altar and you're raising your hands and you're feeling the presence of God and the burden is lifted and your name is written in the Lamb's book of life and the great day of salvation has come and walk out from that live on that high for two months and after that go back chasing David repentance is the difference between King Saul and Apostle Paul repentance is what made one man Apostle after a tremendous experience with God and lack of it made a king an apostate when King Saul prophesies on the ground you never see King Saul ask God a question Lord what would you have me do he rolls on the floor prophesies all of these great things goes off feels good for a month or two and after that picks up where he left off but we see Saul his mission is to kill Christians his reputation is to kill Christians his papers is to kill Christians. he doesn't know any other life that's his life and yet when God encounters he says God what would you have me do you know that question is really really crazy question because that question means if God says you have to go the other way means now you have to be the people you sought to kill all your life that is radical if Saul would ask a question God what would you have me do and God would say retire and David whom you're killing put him on the throne would he do it Apostle Paul did it and he became the greatest apostle King Saul if he would have done it I believe God would have redeemed his life and used it in a way he would have never thought possible because in the moment of our experience with God instead of just getting a feeling of high we have to ask a question Lord what would you have me do many people they thrive and they ride the wave of the presence of God in their life instead of coming down from that feeling and say Lord who you are and what would you have me do if an experience with God does not change the course of my life that experience will be nothing but eventually something that God is going to use against me like in the book of Matthew chapter 7 verse 22 and verse 23 every experience must lead to a deeper level of repentance means it must lead to the change of the course of my life and if it doesn't lead to the change of the course in my life it will eventually lead me to being away from the Lord Saul stopped killing for a season the other Saul stopped killing completely one Saul had an experience the other Saul had repentance. One Saul became apostate, the other Saul became an apostle. And I want us today to be like Apostle Paul. I want us to be today like Apostle Saul. He was a man who had an experience and after that he was completely changed. Repentance is what makes a big difference between the, these two men. Repentance is a change of direction. It means you were going one way Repentance is not stopping when you realize you're headed in the wrong direction. 
repentance is turning around and heading in the right direction. I remember one time I was driving from a, um, a weekend, well it was weekend but I didn't uh, stay till Sunday of getaway that I went for prayer and fasting and I was driving back and I, I was calling uh, my aunt Larissa who um, I was sharing revelations with her that I got on this prayer retreat and I was so excited and I was sharing and sharing that I missed my exit and I kept going 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 and from Portland that I got all the way to Pendleton and so and I realized I'm like mountains are more beautiful I've never seen anything like this and so in my mind I'm thinking like wow the presence of God is great even things look better now until you know I looked at my phone and I realized it's been 40 minutes I was talking to her and I was like you know what I think I need to hang up I need to rediscover this beautiful place that I'm looking at and what I found out is I am literally 40 minutes away from my exit and while I'm so excited I am headed in the wrong direction and I was even kind of speeding a little bit and little did I know is I was speeding going in the wrong direction and repentance is when you realize you're headed in the wrong direction repentance is not pulling over repentance is not stopping and says oh man that's bad repentance is a u-turn it's when you're going one way and you realize you need to go completely opposite Saul pulled over for a few months stopped chasing David stopped killing David for a little time but that's not repentance repentance is not pulling over repentance is going completely opposite way people look at you and they say you were killing and now you're one of them that is repentance when Paul says you know what I was killing them but now he is one of them that is repentance and until that takes place in a person's life their experience no matter how extraordinary it is it will never bring a change in their life God's presence in your life requires your participation and your participation is you willingly make a choice that I'm going in this way and now I am gonna go in the way that's completely opposite that I used to go into can somebody say amen one, my wonderful roommate few uh, last week he was going to an interview in in a local store in the mall and he is not very knowledgeable of this area but he has a GPS and he put the wrong address in the GPS he was supposed to go to the mall to go for interview and he like many people in our generation like to test and tempt the Lord by driving their car on E on empty and so when he was driving on empty and I'm over here on Friday night it was actually last week and I'm over here praying you know just kind of really preparing for Sunday service and all things are great and then he calls me and so I ignore the, the phone call because I'm like you're supposed to go to the interview you shouldn't be calling me and then second time he calls me and I just felt compelled to pick up the phone and he said hey bro I'm out of gas and I was like fine I'll just go get you a gas I'm like where are you and this is the question nobody wants to hear I don't know <laughs> I was like can you go outside of your window and take a picture he's like I will he does but the picture doesn't go through so I get in my car and he says I am on 240 I was like 240 is, is not helping me I get in my car and I'm thinking he says I see a golf course or something a river on one side and and so and I'm thinking he's all the way there all the way by Winko I fly literally to all the way to Winkle, find a gas tank and full, uh, a, a gas, a gallon thing, pour some gas and I'm looking just literally turning around left and right. I'm like bro I cannot see you. It turns out he was all the way by the church. So not only he ran out of gas but he ran out of gas going to a completely different direction. You know and what happened to him is what happens to many people in their life is many times they're headed in the wrong direction and what God causes is God causes us to run out of gas God causes certain things to happen and we come to church and we get a miracle we get a breakthrough but that miracle and that breakthrough is not to give you strength to keep going in the wrong direction and when I came to him I was like bro we filled in gas but you are not going to the mall you're going to downtown Kenwick 
Your interview is behind you, not in front of you. So I'm like, if you want to get there, you got to turn around. And you, that's how you're going to get to your appointment. My friend, repentance is when you come to God. God touches you. He fills you up. Not so that you can keep going where you were headed because that's how you will miss your appointment with your destiny. But when you get filled, when you experience God and you turn around to go back to your destiny. Can somebody say amen? And sometimes you have, you've lost some time. I know talking to some people who get saved and they look back at their life and they say, I've lost so much time. I could have gotten so much with my life if I would have been serving God. And that's exactly what happens when you go in the wrong direction. You're going to have some catching up to do. Can somebody say amen? If you're in this room today and you're like Saul, either of them, going to Damascus, maybe going to school, going to work or even going to church but your reasons for going are not right God wants to meet you maybe you are here and God have met you before and you've had an experience with the Lord your mood changed but the course of your life is still the same this must change and it must change this morning you cannot allow yourself to live another day you think by giving up everything to God, your idea to kill Christians, you're going to lose yourself. History knows nobody greater than Apostle Paul. Why? Because he gave everything to God. It was so dear to him at that moment to be popular in a religion called Judaism. But to God, it was more important that he gave it up and served God. And today, we all know Apostle Paul. The world knows Apostle Paul. But you're not doing that so the world will know you. You are doing that so you can be with the Lord and not be like King Saul and end up being apostate. I'm going to finish on this. There was a story that happened in Texas. One little boy had a really wealthy parents. At the age of 16... He got his license and his parents bought him. His parents were really, really wealthy. And they bought him a Porsche. Really nice car. So he decided to celebrate his birthday with his homies. And they brought the booze. He brought the Porsche. The girls came. And the parents were not there. And so they, they all decided to party like there is no tomorrow. 16 years, years of age. He just, you know, he now has a license. He can drive. He can show off and they got drunk, drugged up, had sex, all the stuff that all the teenagers only dream of when they're not with Christ. At night, everybody starts going home. He got on his Porsche. He starts to drive. The only problem is he was not seeing where he was driving because he was completely high. As he was driving, he got into this ramp and there was a cliff behind that ramp. And his Porsche is really strong. He was flying, not really driving. He hit the ramp and his Porsche was hanging in the balance. Half of the car was hanging over a cliff and the other half was still on the highway. The moment he saw that, I mean all of that high went off. He woke up right away. The only problem is it was three in the morning and there was nobody else around. If he makes one move, his car will tip down, will fall and explode because the cliff is too high. And if he gets out, he, he will not get home because he's very far from home. And this is when he started to cry out to God for help. And there was a car that was pulling in. And the gentleman saw that the Porsche hanging in balance. He drove by and he, you know, asked if there's anybody there. And the little boy scared. He says, yes, sir, I'm here. Could, could you please help me? He says, there's only one way I can help you out of this situation. He says, you're going to have to open the front door. And if he opens the front door, there is, there's, I mean, he's off of the cliff already. He says, I'm going to hold on to the bumper for only three seconds. And you will have three seconds to jump from your car on the road. If you don't do it, I'm going to release and the car will go down and you will go down too. So the boy got, got ready. He says, are you ready? He says, yes. And he he held it the boy opens the door jumps out and <laughs> lands on a highway the car falls explodes and, and all the stuff the boy takes the boy gives him a hug the man hugs the boy and says you know you're safe everything is good 
and he tells him he says I'm gonna take you home and I'm also gonna sign you up for the rehab he said you smell alcohol he said you're high he says your life must change he says the fact that you're saved and your Porsche died this is nothing yet he says you must change the course of your life he said, I'm not asking you to stop just doing drugs I'm asking you to change that you have to change the course of your life and the boy promised he says oh yes sir I will never trust me never ever I will drink I will never use drugs and I'm just I'm just gonna go to school and just gonna be a good boy I promise you he made a promise first month he still had nightmares of falling off of the cliff second week everything started to fade away two months later it remained as a distant memory in his mind that he was on the edge of death and the fourth month he started to go back to the parties but he vowed he will never drink he will just be there for support because he's so popular on the sixth month he drank just a little bit he just had his parents take him home now he didn't take himself home he saw that as improvement on the eighth month he got drunk he got pulled over they found drugs on him and they they locked him up the next day he had to go to court and as he steps into court to his biggest amazement he sees the same man sitting on that chair that rescued him on the highway so he got really happy he says this man knows me he saved me when I was about to die I made a promise to him he's gonna help me he tells his lawyer everything's gonna be fine I know that man I know his name he knows me and he stepped over there with a smile on his face he says your honor do you remember me you're the one who saved me when I was over there my Porsche was about to die at the age of 16 your honor thank you so much do you remember me and he says yes I do remember you he says uh, you're gonna help me now right and this is what he said that day I was your savior this day I am your judge that experience you had did not change the course of your life today I am not just going to be the one who gave you that experience I'm going to be also the one who is going to judge you your course wasn't changed you may say God will never do that why do you think the first message Jesus had to people repent God is asking today of you and me the direction of your life must change the direction of your life must change you cannot lean on the fact when you were six when you were seven and you came to the front you gave your life to Jesus Christ your direction must change and it must change today I wish if I could grab some of you and just let it scream in your ear until I lose my voice because on that day it's gonna to be too late and I know especially when looking at young people you know their life is still ahead of them and many times they feel like well someday one day but I want us to realize that someday and that one day is today in Jesus name amen your experience and the fact that your parents are Christians and the fact that one day long time ago you got baptized in the Holy Ghost and we dunked you in that pool all of that will not mean much if you're still driving in the wrong direction turn around today I'm not talking about cry I'm not talking about feel bad some of you say I don't feel bad I'm gonna change when I feel bad when I found out I was driving to Pendleton I did not wait and says I'm gonna keep driving until I will feel bad about driving driving to Pendleton if I would think that then I need to be hit with the baseball twice baseball bat and that's how people do today they're like I am not gonna change my life until something bad happens really why would you want to do that the moment it hits you wait I'm in the wrong I'm going in the wrong place you stop and you turn around the same second and then you can go from being the persecutor to the greatest apostle that the church has ever had in Jesus name amen